Well, I think we're live now. Everyone, welcome to the panel. I see the clock is counting down, so we are live. <laughs> um, if you'll notice on the screen, the likeness of me is quite good today. <laughs> um, they're missing the beard, though. Um, the today's panel is the Media Everywhere Opportunity, How OTT is Changing the Game. We're joined today by Scott Rosenberg, VP of Business Development, Content and Services from Roku. And at the end, we've got Eric Anderson, VP of Content and Product Solutions from Samsung Electronics, and Tom Morgan, CEO of Net2 Television. Before we kick into the panel, would each of you just take a minute to talk about your company just very briefly, what you do for them, maybe a little background in terms of your perspective on sure. OTT? Tom, yeah. why don't you kick um, off? Net2 uh, uh, literally funded this last year, and its job is to act as a distributor for uh, branded channels and, uh, and programming partners that want to get on you know, platforms like Eric's and the rest. Um, on the belief that the killer application for smart television is actually television. So we work with <laughs> dot coms taking short form, making it into longer form things that are appropriate for the lean back experience that Eric has pioneered. Right. Gotcha. Thanks. Uh, Samsung's a small startup out of Korea. <laughs> um, and uh, we, you know, re really focusing on uh, looking at all of our connected devices, we have probably the largest portfolio of connected devices in the world right now from TVs, laptops, tablets, phones, refrigerators, and now even, yes, washers and dryers, in case you're wondering. Uh, so my, my duty is to look across those portfolios and figure out what the experience should be, uh, how we best use partners to provide con consumers with access and discovery to the content that they're looking for. Thanks. I'm Scott Rosenberg from Roku. We make uh, streaming video devices, which you can find pretty much anywhere today. We're, we're closing in on 5 million units in the field and uh, drive a ton of usage on the platform. 700 channels, we're adding a channel a day on average. And um, you know, my specific focus is onboarding content partners and helping them drive revenues. Thanks. And for those who don't know who me, uh, Greg Fossen, President and Principal Analyst at X Media Research, been industry analyst for about 14 years now. I'm also producer of several industry conferences. OTTCon is one of our better known conferences specifically focused on the over the top and broadband TV space. So we're gonna have a good discussion today. The conference is, is when I was approached to this panel, um, the push was let's talk about disruption and how OTT is disruptive to business models, whether you're a content producer, a consumer electronics manufacturer, like we have two up here. Um, and I wanna hit this panel really from two angles. How it's disruptive on the industry side, and then after that we'll transition over to how is this disruptive for the consumer, and then how that circles back and is influencing things. But let's talk a little bit about this. Tom, I know you're, I'm gonna hit you first, because I know you're a student of television and television history. Mm -hmm. All right. So, you know, as we've looked at the industry, we've, we sort of call what we're in right now about the fourth generation of television. You, know, you saw the big entertainment platform was radio. You saw talent, resources, value moving into the TV space. You saw a gen of the next generation where you were adding multiple TVs in the space, a generation where you had then the big distribution platform was cable. Right. And, and now we're in another transition phase where we have broadband, we have the internet, as a big distribution platform. So talk about how you see this transition compared to the other transitions we've been in, the sustainability, the value that can move over into this space, talent, resources, everything like that. I think we're at an inflection point that hasn't been seen since August 28th, 1948. I am a Okay, we're going, way, we're going way back then. <laughs> and oh, that, that was the day that Frank Stanton got on CBS radio and announced that CBS had just signed Milton Berle, Lucille Ball, Burns and Allen, and Jack Benny to radio contracts and television contracts, and it was the first talent raid. Mm -hmm. But what it was was a transition of programming formats from radio to TV. Gotcha. That was the, the main watershed of the origins of history of television. And then we had things like the Texaco Hour developed and everything else, big sponsorships. We're almost back to some of those models. How do the underwriters play a role? What is the role of Mattel or Amex or people like that in this new world? And how do you distribute programming on these new platforms, especially since the carriage model of pay TV is being challenged by price escalations and retransmission and sports escalations? You know, the four big broadcast networks with retrans are gonna pick up another buck 25 uh, per network. That's $5 cost of increase of content. 
this ESPN sports escalations, 25% escalation. If you haven't been paying attention to what's going on with the Dodgers out in LA, it's amazing what's going on out there. So you're seeing major escalation in the sports fees. And then you know, uh, Jeff Bukas over at Time Warner saying, I'm going to increases in TNT and the rest because we're underpaid given our ratings, start flushing out the low end networks. So there's new opportunities here, but you can't go in assuming that you're going to get Comcast to pay you a nickel or something like that. The carriage checkbook, which has been the lifeblood of a lot of right. independent pay television in the United States, is now locked in the drawer. So how do you put programming onto Eric's platform in a way that makes economic sense and that scales, and how do you build scale, and then what's the revenue model? So the, you know, this marketplace right now is traditional broadcast and affiliate licensing into the, the local stations. The interesting thing is going to be where's the digital marketplace develop and how do those economics work as we go through this transition? Gotcha. Well, you know, Scott, you're involved in that. As you're, as you're looking at pulling in more content producers, you're adding, you've got, say, 700 channels, you're adding about a channel a day. So how do you see this transition? I mean, you're, it's fair to say without this transition, Roku doesn't even exist. In yeah. a way, because you know, you're, you're using broadband as the distribution platform through the Roku box, but you're adding all these channels. So how do you see the mix in terms of traditional content that people are accessing on Roku and then new talent moving in, producing original content, and monetizing that? Yeah, I, I mean, at the end of the day, I think it's about optionality. And that, that's not just for the consumer mm -hmm. in terms of how they choose to get their content, but for the, the, the program originators. And so you know, all the, all the uh, platforms, the apps that you'd expect to do well on our platform, the, you know, kind of the over-the-top leaders are doing well. But we, we also see this really vibrant, long tail of, uh, of users, you know, you know, adamant karate, uh, cr you know, karate fans and uh, religious groups, and and uh, you know, we we uh, at Roku specifically are, you know, try to operate with a pretty open platform, mm -hmm. and uh, um, you know, try to also not. Um, you know, I think there's a tendency in the industry to assume it's a zero sum game, right? It's either over the top or it's the traditional model, and. And in fact, what we're seeing on our platform is a, is a complementary set of behaviors. Mm -hmm. And 2013 is a really big year for us in terms of onboarding authenticated uh, experiences. We just announced a big deal with Time Warner uh, at CES, where you can get all 300 channels if you're a Time Warner sub. Right. We've got a pretty deep pipeline of TV networks coming on with authenticated uh, um, channels. A couple of years ago, you, know, you wouldn't have imagined that that was possible because everybody was stuck in this uh, cannibalization mindset. But I think folks are coming sure. around to this belief that um, you know, if it's the same subscriber and at least the same revenues coming in the door and it's a new, new set of discovery mechanisms, maybe it's not a zero-sum game. Maybe it's additive. Okay. So, Eric, I don't want to ignore you here, but I want to follow up a little bit on what you said. Yeah. It's not a zero-sum game. Authentication or OTT is definitely allowing it to be complementary to traditional TV, not a zero-sum game. But do you then also still see a role where OTT in and of its own right or broadband TV is competitive from a monetization standpoint, from, from a content standpoint, the resources that are being put in there. Do, do you want to feel? Do you want to feel this? Do you want me to go ahead and then I'll follow, follow up with Eric? Okay. I mean, I guess I, I guess uh, to the extent that we have finite hours in the day and finite wallets, uh, you know, it is competitive, right? Uh, and we do see new. Uh, uh, viewing behaviors evolving, which at the end of the day do start to cannibalize into uh, legacy viewing behaviors. You know, sort of the binge viewing habit is a, a whole new phenomena that uh, didn't exist a few years ago. Um, so, uh, you know, I do think it's competitive in that respect, and the dollars are going to move around in, in the business. Um, but I still think there's a really uh, important place to play for, for the traditional distributors and, uh, and uh, programmers. Okay. Eric, let's talk a little bit about how this transition to, to broadband as a platform, as a distribution platform and OTT has been disruptive to your business and how you see that then ongoing. Well, uh, I guess disruptive in a good way uh, mm -hmm. because uh, more access points, more devices um, and, uh, you know, for consumption and, and uh, for our portfolio, it's been nothing but positive. I think, um, you know, for our partners, I think the other inflection point we're probably seeing here is um, 
kind of what we did 20, 30 years ago. Tom can probably get the, the dates right, but <laughs> the last time He that can the go back to 1948 at <laughs> least. Yeah, so. I was there, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> the last time the broadcasters really had that direct affinity into the living room was you know, pre-cable in mm -hmm. a lot of ways. Yeah. And I think now you're starting to see a leveling out of balance of more uh, choice and control by the consumer, more direct um, affinity and con mm -hmm. contact with that living room from the broadcasters. I think the other thing is that the other thing is that um, you know we have different players now as well, whether it be YouTube or some original programming types of creation that's happening as well, mm -hmm. and it is creating new behaviors, uh, you know, by the consumer. It's it's. It's still lean back, but it's not grazing. I think we're we're hunting more as far as what we want to you know get to and what we want to consume, uh, given that time that we have in front of that TV. Right. And I think the other thing that it's allowing is that second screen uh, device capability that is complementary uh, complementary to what's going on on the main screen. Um, we're doing some things now with. Uh, directors and producers who are looking at scripts a whole different way. You know, when, what mm -hmm. would happen when you're sitting down at the origination of the script and you know that that tablet's in the room? You know, how can you use that more effectively? And I think over-the-top connected devices is now leading into that new genre of, mm -hmm. of entertainment. I, um, that being said, there's challenges. I mean, I okay. think the biggest challenge is monetization. I think the biggest challenge with that is how do we rate meter and uh, have the right analytics to be able to show that OTT and second screen consumption is, what, what, what is it doing? And how can we monetize that and bring it into the current currency system? So, so what I are some of the ways you're helping content producers that are coming onto your platform, accessing content through the various apps? How are you helping them to realize that on the monetization side? and understanding the metrics of what people are watching. Well, there's only so much that you know, we as a company can do. We can help in capturing that data, but uh, I don't think the industry looks at Samsung as being a <laughs> currency rating right. company. So it's working with those types of companies to, you know, how do we update uh, what's happening out there? How can we uh, provide the experiences that we're seeing across our base to help uh, influence that, sure. new, that new business of, of rating and metering you know, for the next uh, 20 years? Yeah. Tom, now I know your platform that you're launching really is, is solving kind of a critical issue here with respect to monetization. Uh, it's traditionally been a little bit of a problem because as traditional content producers, programmers, they're always faced with this or have been traditionally faced with the digital dollars right. or, or digital cents versus uh, traditional dollars. So how, do you, how does your platform help programmers solve this? One of the interesting producers? things if you do believe that ad-supported television is one of the killer app applications on, on Eric's platform. Um, how does longer form lean back kind of experiences support an ad model that's appropriate for the viewer and, and what the viewer expects? You've all heard about, you know, God invented DVRs because there's too much ad load in ABC <laughs> and everything else. Right. Um, the world of, of longer form, we, we work, with, for example, with CBS and Discovery. But we don't work with the TV sides of CBS and Discovery. We work with the digital sides of CBS and Discovery. So we basically work with uh, CBS Chow and, and, and CNET. And then on Discovery, we work with Revision 3, a brand they recently bought, right. because it has no encumbrance in this world. It can go into OTT without worrying about MFNs and AMDs. But what, for example, what Revision 3 did not have was plain old TV ads. They had a pre-roll and a sponsorship baked into a short form show. So if you basically produce them so it's three to six hours worth of viewing that you could watch at one time if you wanted to, mm -hmm. and there's a normal insertion process, dynamic ad insertion, DAI, mm -hmm. is starting to replace traditional Nielsen C3. Nielsen C3 is, here's the broadcast load, work on that. Our networks work similar to what ABC does with ABC.com when they have two ads per break. They still have six breaks per hour, much lower load, right. and nobody really complains. Why bother skipping it if it's only two ads? You can't pull up the remote fast enough, and why bother pick up the glass of wine, enjoy it? It's a, two, it's a one minute break <laughs> versus a three and a half to five minute break. Um, so if you see a different load, and then it's inserted based on profile, and linkable to the showcases of the Coca-Colas and, and, and uh, 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 the Barbie Mattel uh, uh, showcase. So you're seeing what cable tried to do with Canoe and everything else, dynamic insertion with linkability out to showcases, on this platform we can now do it. 
So I left the cable world back in 08 when in Black Arrow, it was VOD right. ad systems, mm -hmm. moved to the broadband side because we could. Because we can do all the better ad models, lower the load, increase the revenue, um, but make the consumer happier because it's an ad supported world, but something that's not so noisy, not so intrusive. And the advertiser like it because it might be single voice, engagement, so it has a completely different rate card. That's the encouraging yeah. part. I, I think, again, with your kind of disruptive theme, I think one thing that's interesting in, in uh, what, what Tom was saying, how Samsung's helping in f facilitating that is that um, from 2012 and beyond, all of our smart TVs now have built-in automatic content recognition software <laughs> into the firmware. So, um, you know, while these guys are working on how does that monetization, how does that experience work, we're trying to make sure that the, the, the table is set with the right tools and with the right technology so that we can even, you know, accelerate that even further. So whether it be video fingerprinting or audio fingerprinting, a lot of those devices that are in the market today are capable of doing that. Hmm. Now we have to get a little bit smarter in how we build it in and, and make it an, uh, an entertaining experience. We can't, we can't push it too hard, but it has to be relevant and in, within context of what right. people are right. viewing. Your new tumble. UI at CS is really interesting because the first panel was a TV window with recommendations around it. Yeah. And if you have ACR sitting there, then the recommendations might be shows on traditional MVPD, a cable or satellite, mm -hmm. but they could also be internet shows. That's right, it comes you know, from any source. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah. a real integration, the blending of traditional distribution and gotcha. OTT. Mm -hmm. You won't be able to tell the difference. Hmm. Scott, how, in your platform, you see we've got about five million. Let's talk about scale, because really advertising has traditionally been all about scale. Becoming a little bit about, I mean, it, over time, it's, a, it's evolved to try to hit the individual. We're trying to personalize all the advertising. But on your platform, you're about five million installed base. Do you see on an advertising from a monetization standpoint, as it starts to scale, some of those things changing as far as how new content producers are able to monetize their content over your platform? Yeah, yeah I think over the top today is a, a bit upside down. If you just look at who's doing well and who's really driving the usage, right? There's a lot of S, you know, SVOD, subscription VOD. There's a lot of transactional VOD. You've got some services like um, on our platform Crackle and Popcorn Flix, mm -hmm. which are ascendant and doing well. But I think the pure ad supported plays like Tom's are still hard at work trying to construct that economic Absolutely. model. Yeah. And you sort, of, you sort of put the carriage fees away. You don't, you know, you don't start with that right. uh, bit of gold in your pocket, right? And then you start with an ad load that's typically lower. And then from there, you start to try and construct uh, you know, a set of economics uh, based on smarter advertising, interactive advertising, ACR. Um, and so, you know, for, for us, uh, especially this year, bringing on more ad-supported on-demand content um, and authenticated content and giving them the tools to pump up the, uh, the ad economics is a big focus for us. Because we, we do think that over the top, probably won't come back to the same level of you know, ad versus uh, pay that you see in traditional TV, but it does have to swing back more towards a, a healthier ad-supported uh, window for viewership. Okay. I think that's the basis that, of your that business is, and, model. And I would contend that something like ABC.com, you, know, you always hear about the digital pennies and analog dollars and all that stuff, but do the math at ABC.com. They, in, in normal broadcast prime time, they have 20 ads per viewing hour. Yeah. There's four affiliate ads and eight promos for other shows. On ABC.com, there's 12 ads per linear hour, but they sell at a double CPM. So they're actually making 10 cents more a viewer hour with a lighter ad load. It's just that promos are in a different place and the affiliate relationship has changed. Right. So those are the new kinds of economics. I believe that some of the long form, oh, and by the way, ABC for the first time this year included ABC.com and their Hulu inventory in their upfronts, and they guaranteed it. That was right. huge, because mm -hmm. now it's all rolled up. So even this, you still have to be sensitive to the idea that you still want to roll up scale. You need to be part of the fabric of television. Right. Now, but we're, we're still talking here a lot, and when we're talking about the monetization side now, we're still talking a lot about the traditional television content that everybody knows and loves, they can get linear. But as we look at this transition into sort of this fourth generation of television where we've got new original digital content right. being produced, uh, whether it's over YouTube being funded by YouTube or you look at what Warner Brothers is doing with H+, there, there's a whole shift in, in talent 
um, right now producing original content for digital. So how do you apply some of these things that you're doing right now in terms of advertising and monetization for the traditional content that everyone knows? How do you apply that then as we start to have this wealth of content building on the original side? There's, there, go ahead. Go ahead. There, there's new channels coming up um, that have endemic advertisers, advertisers specific to the topic, like O'Neill boards in uh, you know, alternative sports and, and things like that. Um, they traditionally aren't in traditional television, but they can afford to buy in on these platforms because they're very targeted in the rest. So the new channels won't be replacing the old channels because those things will come across because of TV everywhere. Mm -hmm. So cord cutting is an anomaly. That's not right because the bundles will come across. So they'll mm -hmm. just be on all cords. Right. Uh, so that's going to be there no matter what. These new networks are very specialized. They're very deep. They're very vertical. And, and his objective on the UI is to make sure they get exposed to the right person to get to the right audience. Yeah, I, I'm going to take a different tact on, on original, which is, uh, you know, back for us, it's about second screen. It's, it's really about, and most, uh, a lot of the original and top programs uh, out there that are uh, mm -hmm. shooting today are shooting second screen footage right now on hmm. how to combine that with, um, you know, their, their regular uh, episodes. So um, I think, uh, you know, this time next year is going to be really interesting, you know, discussion. Hopefully we can be back here again and talk <laughs> about how that usage is starting to right. increase, how these models are starting to apply. Mm -hmm and how this industry is starting to respond to it. I think we're right on the cusp right now, both from a business side and a user experience side and creation side. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it's, a, it's an amazing time right now because of the, the new technologies and, and options and, and other things that we have at our disposal. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, content, there's no question about it. The content is, is starting to be produced a little bit differently with the social aspect in mind. There's, there's no question about that. Um, Let's talk. I want to transition a little bit over to um, how some of the what's going on at OTT and broadband TV is really impacting the consumer. Um, you know, if you look at, at some of the things that are happening, enabled by, well, let's say Roku. You know, 700 channels, uh, 700 different uh, you know, buttons of where you can access Samsung. I'm not sure on your platform how many different types of content that people can access. But you're looking right now. It seems like as we move into this transition here, that content is becoming more specialized and focused on passionate audiences built around a particular, excuse me, a particular type of content. I mean, I know, what, Tom, on your platform, you've got, you know, food related, um, you know, Revision 3 has done lots of interesting things that, that, that Discovery brought. But on this specialized content, are we looking now at content becoming more fragmented, the consumer becoming more fragmented? communities building more around focused content? It, it, it ranges. If you have a big brand with lots of programming content, like Ch Chow is from CBS, mm -hmm. we build them into a mosaic, and they curate it. They actually take Joan, Joan, Jane Goldman, the head of Chow, um, and let her talk about the six channels that she maintains. Mm -hmm. In other places that are very specialized networks, we actually cluster them based on affinity or interest. Like technology, we put Discovery, Revision 3, Wall Street Journal tech news, um, popular science from Bonnier into a cluster and then we curate that group, almost a mini mall. Because the idea is if you're really into technology, then go deep into these verticals. Here's six of the best verticals we can get you and a host, somebody that knows the topic that can really tell you what's playing within these because there's no TV guide in this world that really works. You got to get them into the into the content reasonably well. Yeah, it, it's funny because you use the word. It's becoming more fragmented, as if that's a bad. No, 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 bad not thing. a bad thing, but it's. But it's, it, 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 it yeah. can be a bad thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but as long as people can find what they're looking for, navigate, discovery, mm -hmm. search, and so forth, the fragmentation is not a bad animal to have. You know, mm -hmm. it, it actually. But that that UI UX needs to be able to. Uh, be more adaptive and adaptive uh, to how people are going to be using it. That's a that's a con consumer in type of approach. Now the other thing that has to happen is the device needs to be a lot smarter on you know the behaviors of the viewer sure. as well and make right. the right recommendations to get to other things because you don't want to get stuck in one rut 
and not be able to experience and explore other things that might be interesting to you. Yeah. So I think a lot of that. So how do you tackle kind of this then, Scott, on your platform? Yeah, I mean, I was going to say, I don't think the industry really solved the search and discovery problem in the old modality. Yeah. Now yeah. We've, yeah. we've made it a whole heck of a lot worse. I used to run the, uh, the program promotion business for, uh, for TV Guide, what, what became Rovi. And, uh, you know, we'd have, we'd have programmers come up to us and, I said, and they'd say, you know, we love your guide. We love that uh, you know we're there on that we're that row, but can you just make our row a little bit bigger and have it flash a little bit? You know, and and, and in many respects, uh, over the top just sort of uh, shatters that into uh, many little pieces. It's a big focus for us uh, in terms of how to uh, help our partners succeed on the platform. This optionality creates creates a headache for for consumers to find stuff they're interested in, and it creates a problem for. Uh, for programmers, you know, the sort that Tom's trying to help um, to get discovered. I, in, I think to that point, what's interesting when you're having these conversations, when people say, well, I need my placement here and I need, really? Because our, our analytics are showing that consumers are not exactly, you know, climbing over themselves to get to your stuff. <laughs> so I think, uh, you know, we're taking a different tact on that. We, we look at the consumer experience, more choice and control. We are not a distributor, mm -hmm. you know. We're about access and discovery to give consumers access to the content that they've already curated or that they want to get to. Right. And I'm not going to dictate to them what they should get to because some programmer says, well, we want ours more flashy. You know what? Compete. Earn, earn, yeah. earn it. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. if you come up and the behaviors are showing that you're picked more than uh, the others, then we'll pay attention. But we've gone for so many years of trying to tell people what they should watch. Let's learn from them now as to what they are watching right. and how we can get the best. Yeah. To a cycle, you know, yeah, I, I do think consumers have a discovery problem. I do think yeah. the, the, the sort of over apification of the of the TV experience is a problem today. Yeah. Um, you, know, you just have too much content siloed into too many different. And if you look at the problem he was solving a while back, you know, in the cable world, I pay $100 a month, I get 500 channels. But according to Nielsen, I watch 15. Do the math. That means 93% of the things I pay for, I don't watch. Right. right. So right. how does this interface or this interface? cut through that, bring the stuff up that is your basic stuff, and then build that personalization around the other things besides those 15 that you want to watch. That's where the new stuff comes in. It's, and there's still nothing on beyond those 15. Get right. me deeper into food. Get me deeper into this. Mm -hmm. So, And that's why personalization for their interfaces is so important. Absolutely. Well, and I think, I think at last count we looked, I think there were about you know, we talked about the over of content. I think at last we count there were about 60,000 different entertainment related apps where you could consume content. You know, and we if we look at the traditional TV experience, traditional content discovery experience, whether it's you know VOD or whether it's traditional TV, you know, we, we've all gone through uh, you know this this uh, problem, 500 channels, nothing on, right? How do I find what I really want to watch? Yeah. And and in some ways, you know, lots of people said, okay, well the app helps that. You know, you've got a specific app. But some of us said, okay, nobody's going to download all 60,000 apps to no, download. Right, right. But at the same time, there's been a difficult time saying, do we have the, what's the one app to rule them all, if you will, you know, take a, uh, a Lord of the Rings metaphor. How do you see that, you know, on your platform, on Roku, what you're doing with uh, content on, on Portico and other things? How, well, do you, how do you solve that, the over appification problem then? Uh, step by step. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> the next step for us was the new UI that we just rolled out, which was, um, as Tom was mentioning, it's really, it's, it's source independent. So mm -hmm. it's really content driven. So right. that it, it, in two ways. One is that when that first screen pops up on your TV, it will show you the history of what you've been sampling. So um, you, know, you, you basically are feeding that to, to tell it, to learn from you and what you know, that particular mm -hmm. household likes. That's one. Two with other search and, and voice recognition kinds of things that we're doing, if you're in the middle of a, a program and, you're, and the program's winding down, you can say, <clears throat> you know, any other sports on today? And it'll, it'll bring up other sport kinds of venues and things of that nature so that you can look to see what sources are providing the best sports content, and then right. you can go to those sources. Mm -hmm. So whereas before, you know, we were stuck in that 500 channels because that was your first UI. That was your first user experience mm -hmm. uh, interface was a one source linear cable box, you know, selection. 
Now what we've done is we said, well, hang on, that's one option, but let's raise that, that first step of selection at a higher level so that I'm seeing what multiple sources can offer me right. and then make my selection from there. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, networks and aggregators really only, they exist for two purposes or, or, or their value add is, uh, t is two things. One is monetization, right? And the other is marketing, retention, right? So you can't, you can't flatten the universe so that the source plays no role here, right? It's, a, it's an essential role. Right. And so you have to create the tools that if you drive somebody into a Netflix or into a Hulu or into a Crackle, that they have a way to keep the person and, and drive right. retention. So I think it's a delicate balance between sort of the consumer facing discovery features and the, uh, the, the content source facing um, features that they need to, uh, to ha have the platform work. I, and I don't think we've got the recipe right yeah. just yet. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm very certain that a, you know, a, kind of a completely flat view of the world doesn't work really uh, for, uh, for the business. To even follow that, I'm kind of old school. <laughs> I believe in Howard Stern. I believe that not only do you get good brands in, from a, that know, are competent in programming, you also get good curators that the consumer trust. Put personality back into television. Mm -hmm. So in everything we do, you'll see us do these mosaics with a curator. And some of those curators will be famous, but they may or may not be television famous, um, or they'll know their subject matter. Right. So we'll cluster programming and say, the UIs help. But if you really don't know what you want to watch and you're into the topic, we'll, pick, we'll help curate some of the best programming you can and give you a zone around that. It's all ad supported and everything else, but it's thematic. So the thematic clusters help, the, uh, besides the better UIs and navigation yeah. and search, which mm -hmm. we depend on them for because they control the platform. Um, the other idea is we'll cluster programming into different groups of affinities and back into, you know, it's a mini mall. You know, right. Why is there Noah's, Noah's bagel next to, to right. Starbucks? Because when you buy a coffee, you buy a bagel. You know, right. give a mouse a cookie, the, mm -hmm. you, know, it, you know, whatever, you know, <laughs> you know the deal. So in the, in the curious, uh, but you know, if you're going out and curating and, and looking for that content, and of course, Scott, on your platform, you're actively going out trying to pull in content producers. But if I'm an independent content producer, I've got some funding I'm doing, whether it's uh, you know, scripted television, whether I'm doing an independent channel, how do I get noticed? How do you find me? How do I, you know, how do, how do I get integrated into your curation process? You know, what's my approach then rising above the noise level? And I think that's really been a challenge for a lot and people producing content now in, in this new era of, of OTT and, and broadband TV, saying, yes, there's content, it's great, it's professionally produced. How does it scale then upwards to take advantage of the monetization opportunities on your platform? How does it scale up to get to build the audience? You know, that's, that's an issue right now, we, I think. We think there's, in the United States right now, we think there's about 40 million active connected TV or connected devices that look and smell like TVs that are designed for the living room. I mean, there's tablets, there's phones and everything else, but it's the main best available big screen in American households, and that's just in the US. There's about 40 million active. So the question is, how do you, if you're just ad supported versus paywall supported, right. how do you get across enough screens to make it a viable gross rating points kind of business and then get discovery? So getting on the platforms efficiently, building into the user interfaces and the rest is where we focus and, right. and helping the, distribute. We're just a distributor in the sense that we don't program, we aggregate programming and get on the platforms and build audience scale because mm -hmm. it's, it's ad-driven television. At least that side we're in. So that's where we focus. And we do it by deploying as much cloud technology as we can to build scale and especially for not only the programmers but also for the advertisers. That's it. Well, and how, I mean, this is a challenge. We've talked a little bit about some of the challenges that some of the content producers are have in terms of the varying consumer electronic platforms that they want to be on. If they've got their content, they have to encode and develop for dozens of unique right. APIs. They've got you know developed for Samsung, maybe they have to develop for Roku. You know, you look we think we talked earlier about HBO Go has 39 dedicated people, dedicated developers that are developing for all the different platforms. If you're HBO, you can afford that. That's right. right. <laughs> if you're you know, a, a, a guy who's been venture funded, maybe, you know, you're one guy with a camera crew and you're producing some not great too stuff. Easy, yeah. How are you going to support 39 developers? How are you going to get on all those platforms? Well, you're not. I mean, <laughs> you know, the vast majority of uh, uh, programmers that we're speaking to are actively pruning the, the platforms yeah. that they're going to support. They're just, they're, 
they've, they've, they've drawn a line and the line's going up each year, you know, and if, if the device doesn't clear a certain footprint, if the device clears a footprint but it doesn't drive a certain minimum usage, if the device doesn't have, um, you know, all the essential technologies and monetization capabilities, it's out. And for us, that's a good thing because it's, it's creating a vacuum. Yep. Uh, the industry needs a TVOS. We're a great solution. We've got some really novel approaches to that. Um, but it, it's a problem. I mean, even for, for guys that you think are big media companies, they just can't target that many OTT sure. platforms today. Mm -hmm. And the legacy systems are basically the gaming devices to start, you know, Xbox and, and PlayStation. I think that gives away, he's got the biggest footprint. His footprint is big because anybody that buys a Roku, by definition, is connected. Right. You know, can't yeah. use it otherwise. Yeah. So, right, you don't, okay. you don't take it home and then not plug it in. I've been so <laughs> close, <laughs> but most of them are actually the inactive. So, so. It becomes a very nice paperweight. Yeah, 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 so. yeah. Right, what are you, and what are you doing, you know, when, when you look at Samsung, you say, okay, we've got our unique platform that people need to develop for, but, you know, if they say, well, look, I'd like to develop for your platform, I've also got to develop for LG, Philips, Everybody else out there, how can you know? How can you guys make that easier then on the smaller guys over time? Do you see any ability to to ease the load on the developer? Are you there? talking to me or, or I'm talking to Derek? He's going to eat them all. That's his. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, there, there's commonalities. I mean, you know, whether HTML5 and some, you know, there's some basic standardized kinds of things mm -hmm. that people are gravitating towards. Or, um, but when it comes down to a hardware platform. Uh, Sorry, but that's just, you know, that's engineering. So, you know, you're not going to get these big brand OEMs to, to sing Kumbaya and come together and say, you're right, we'll use the same chipset and we'll use the same. <laughs> right. it's, it's not going to happen. But I think, uh, you know, I was, I was in the content side before I got onto the device side, and, and it just comes down to analytics and data. I mean, which ones are performing? And looking at the, at the sell through and the, and the footprint and things of that nature, and if you have that discipline, it's not that hard to manage. And for those that say, well, I got to be on 20 different devices, really? Have you looked at your data lately? You know, it probably it's the 80-20 rule, just like everything else. So, yeah. uh, you know, pick your, your fast five and work and, and refine that, and then see if you can be the best experience on those best performers. I mean, that's, that's the way to go. If you're stretching out your dollar to try to get the masses, you're never going to get good at a user experience on the top five or the top four. Right. And that's what it's about right now, because everybody has the same content. You know, Scott and I have the same content, you know, LG, Panasonic, or whatever. Now it's about you know, who has the best um, Major League Baseball experience, or who has the right. best Hulu experience, or, or that, that sort of thing. That's where the investments are starting to go to now, and that's how we're trying to make that a better experience for the consumer. Gotcha. Jim Tom. Yeah, we're slightly different a little bit in the fact that we primarily focus on long form, basically long form television. Mm -hmm. So we do as much in the cloud as we can to get as much scale for our networks as we can. Our whole objective is get people to watch our, the, the programs that we distribute. Right. So whether how we fit into the UI, different UIs work different ways. We, you know, we behave differently as we move out to places like Roku. We'll behave differently as we move out to places like Eric's platform. But on the whole, we try to do as much as we can by extrapolating. You know, our HTML5 is on the cloud because ours is a lightweight kind of application. If you want a more robust application, you've got to make the investment with the SDKs. We play video, you know, so we're more player-based than we are heavy development-based. And that focuses on its footprint scale. Because um, I'm trying to get our networks on as many platforms as I can. You know, I may start on some and emphasize on some and do some custom work on some. Right. Um, but on the whole, it's still, my business is GRP based, gross rating points. I got to get gross rating points for my networks. Right. Yeah, uh, you know, it's a bit of a riff on Eric's comments, but I think the fatal flaw in the connected TV, connected streaming player device market is uh, folks don't know where to draw the line and they put everything in the kitchen sink and into these platforms and then it drives the price point of the platform up, which dramatically reduces the, the appeal and the sell through. And then just doesn't, doesn't always result in a great experience. So, so I think a number of these uh, connected TV platforms or OSs that, that we, uh, we compete with just suffer from, you know, they're, they're not easy to use, they're not easy to set up, they're expensive, they lack content. Um, right. 
And uh, you know, I think that's where we've, we've excelled, and I think that's where you'll see a lot of the growth in the connected TV space. You'll have the Samsungs and the LGs at the top of the TV OEM market, but then every Chinese brand uh, under the sun is going to ship um, you know, connected TV platform. We, right. we did 14 deals at CES where folks are going to embed the Roku uh, uh, TV OS. Mm -hmm. And so, so I think you'll see a lot of activity there. And the, the key to success in, in that segment is it's uh, affordable, right? It's not a $250 adder to your TV because the data shows consumers don't, you know, that's not a top one, two, three feature set. And, uh, and it just works and it's simple. And, and the, the content selection is rich. Gotcha. We don't have a lot of time left, but I want to hit just kind of a couple, couple of quick, uh, there's kind of quick fire questions. Let's just talk about, because the, the main thing we're talking about with monetization here is advertising. Let's get your prediction here. In, the, in this new era of broadband TV and OTT, do the advertising dollars shrink, grow, or stay the same over time? For pool. television overall or for? for all, all inclusive, traditional television, OTT. Increase. Increase. All the, at, that pool increases. Yeah, because we'll be able to do more with the ads and, and where we'll steal the money will be out of direct response. So that's the budget we'll cannibalize. So we'll have the normal display ads, that, I mean, the m normal television ads that television's always done in this platform, but now we can do a whole lot more that we're on the, these IP-based platforms. I, I think it'll increase, but I think we got a lot of things to work out um, yeah. in addition to just enabling it technology-wise and um, philosophically, method-wise. you know, wise. I think we also have to measure how the behaviors are changing with the consumer and you know, whether they're going to accept these new models and, and so forth. So I think we got to be smart about how we approach it. Yeah. Okay. Scott? Yeah, I mean, I don't have a PhD in macroeconomics, but I feel like uh, the dollars at the top of the funnel are set by c consumption, you know, how many people are buying cars and household products. And so that's, that sort of sets the table of the amount of TV dollars to go around. I do think there'll be a shift into over the top, but as Eric said, we're, we're early days. I mean, we're... But the budgets a lot that, of work to do. The budgets that are showing up are the TV budgets, mm -hmm. not the display. Well, the display budgets are always here, and this is new, the pre-roll business, everything else. What is really encouraging is the big ad dollars out of the television buys are starting to shift money into this marketplace and get an early seat at the table. That's really encouraging. Gotcha. We've probably got just a few minutes left. I wanted to invite some questions from the audience in case there were some follow-up questions to anything we've discussed today for, for Tom or Eric or Scott. If uh, we'll open it up the last few minutes to the floor. Go ahead, we've got two microphones here. Yeah, I'm just, I'm interested just, I don't really know much about the Roku business model. Could you talk about Roku? And where then the revenue stream other than when I buy the box? Yeah, sure. Um, well, we excel at building these boxes affordably, so we do make money on them. Um, and generally, we, we, uh, we partner with our content providers. And uh, when they succeed, when they drive a new subscription or sell a movie or uh, insert advertising, generally we have a relationship that incents us to help them get there and, and uh, shares, shares revenues back with us. Okay. Any other questions from the audience? Thank you. Uh, Tom, I'm curious about where you see um, scale fitting into this as it exists right now. Uh, Mark Cuban, I think, mentioned in the keynote that even the smallest cable station in the middle of the night might have 300,000 views. But on video, that's uh, a, a major uh, success. Yep. So even though the ad dollars might start going more into um, what's online, the scale, especially with fragmentation, et cetera. Yeah. Great question. Um, the key is something I mentioned before called DAI, dynamic ad insertion, allows you to roll up even the 3,000 views at a small cable network into a group buy that's sold as an aggregated pool. If you look at what's happening on the cable side, for example, to Canoe, Canoe's not dead. Canoe's being refocused entirely to do one thing, build an ad network for the cable ad sales teams. 40% of cable ad inventory at the local level goes unsold. If the cable industry can roll it up and use a dynamic system like Black Arrow or like Freewheel or something like that, then they can actually turn that local station unsold inventory as part of a national buy. Cable can go national. In fact, they will. You'll see national ad sales forces 
take NCC in the industry, the cross interop, uh, or interconnect ad sales team, and think of it as a national ad sales force. That gets really intriguing. So since now all the ads in television are dynamic and controlled by a rules engine, you can roll them up. It, it, it allows the, the fragmentation of the small operator to actually participate and have a sell-through of a much higher level. And how does that affect small producers? Like we have an online television show, and we're, we have a lot of content that can be packaged into long form. And, but how does that translate in, in that regard? To it, it's it's economics? a very hard set of decisions. I, I understand your pain. Um, if you go into ad networks and ad exchanges, uh, this display ad industry got commoditized by an overabundance of inventory sold cheaply with automatic exchanges. We don't tend to work with exchanges or networks because we believe they'll commoditize the industry. Um, and therefore, you can't build television on a $4 CPM. It's just impossible. Right. Uh, you can't do the math. So the issue is, how do you participate with something that's useful and scalable but keep the CPMs where they need to be and provide value to that advertiser? And who is that advertiser? So picking and choosing your ad sales strategy and who you work with is probably the hardest decision of all. Um, there's a lot of people that come in and say, okay, I'll build an exchange, just throw your inventory in, I'll make sure it's sold, and every seat on the airline is sold. Yeah, at what price? Um, no airline will, you know, you really don't want to sell airline seats if it's below the cost of fuel. Makes no sense. Likewise, if you sell your inventory into a wholesaler and the wholesaler destroys your business. It's why also, like, um, Fox decided not to let uh, YouTube buy Hulu for, like, two to three billion dollars because they believe that there'd be a $4 CPM on the eighth day of television, <laughs> the windowing problem. Um, so that is probably the biggest question and the biggest issue in the whole industry, is how is the ad monetization strategies done? Because it's not a carriage question anymore. You know what the bundles look like. There will be virtual operators. It's how the ad load is, is managed, what it looks like, and who sells it and who rolls it up. That's the biggest economic question. It's only a $70 billion question. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Good. Uh, gentlemen, I think we're down to our last few seconds in the panel. I appreciate your perspectives. Appreciate you being here. Thanks for sharing your insights with us and with the audience. Thanks, Greg. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.